kidnapped Lagos Fire Service Director Razaki Musibao and six others gained freedom. IMF urges Nigeria to remove controversial fuel subsidy. In international news, Netanyahu claims victory in Israel's election in which outcome is too close to call. And in sport, NFF confirms Nigeria legend Christian Chiku is in good health. This is ANN News. I am Olaju Mokio Latunji. We begin today on an uplifting note. The director of Lagos State Fire Service, Razaki Mosibao, and six others who were kidnapped at Agenary in Ikurudu have regained freedom unhurt on Tuesday night. Police Public Relations Officer Bala Elkana confirmed the developments in a statement on Wednesday. The seven men were adopted on Saturday night at Agenary along Itoki Ekbe Road, and the victims have since reunited with their families. Good news indeed. In about seven weeks from now, the tenure of Akumi Ambade as governor of Lagos State will come to an end. A new administration will kick off under the leadership of Governor-elect Babajide Sonwolu. To ensure a smooth transfer of power, Governor Ambade has inaugurated a 20-member transition committee. The incumbent governor says this is important because a smooth transition is critical to ensuring the government's machinery continues to run without a hitch considering the economic importance of Lagos to Nigeria. Babajide Sonwulu of the All Progressives Congress won the state's governorship election in March. He will be sworn in at the end of May. The transition committee will be co-chaired by the state deputy governor-elect, Dr. Obafemi Hamzat, and the secretary to the state government, Tunji Bello. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, has called on Nigeria to remove its controversial fuel subsidy. It says instead the federal government should increase its social spending on the poor as a means of reducing poverty in the country. The fund also says facing out fuel subsidies while strengthening social safety nets would help reduce the poverty gap and free up additional fiscal space. Did you Bartman's report? It's actually not the first time the IMF is asking Nigeria to remove its controversial petrol subsidy, but on each and every occasion, the government has refused to budge. I think the removal of fuel subsidy has been long, long overdue. Uh, for several years, way back 10, 15, 20 years, it was obvious that we needed to remove the subsidy. With due respect to, to IMF, Nigerians require subsidy. We require subsidy in health, we require subsidy in education, we require subsidy in transportation. We require subsidy in energy. Petrol subsidy is arguably the most controversial topic in Nigeria. No government in the country has been able to remove it. A bid to do away with the subsidy in 2012 led to a nationwide protest that lasted for days until the government at the time was forced to back down. It is not, never too late to do the right thing. So, and it's nothing to do with whether IMF says so or not. It is, uh, the, the logic is self-justifying, is self-evident to us that we need to remove the, the subsidies. If this thing is removed, it will grind Nigerian economy to a halt. If you try increasing the price of petrol, people, even criminals in Sambisa forest will feel the heat. That is the extent to which that thing affects and will permeate through the, the, the strata of Nigerian economy and cause us heat and pain. The removal of petrol subsidy is a delicate banana peel no government in this country wants to step on. Even the current government actually broached the idea when it first came to power in 2015 but had to abandon it altogether, fearing a possible political backlash from the people. The fact that subsidy has been mismanaged or abused in Nigeria, you know, does not discount it or discountenant it from being a universally economic cushioning concept. Failure to remove the subsidy is the primary reason why we haven't seen a lot of refineries being built in Nigeria. So the people 
do not enjoy the benefit of the subsidy. The jobs that are to be created by new refineries are not being built. With all its four publicly owned refineries almost comatose, Nigeria imports an average of 91% of its daily consumption of refined petrol and spends billions of dollars subsidizing the price at which it is sold. The government currently pegs the price of a liter of petrol at about 40 US cents, the lowest among the country's neighbors, thereby creating an incentive for smuggling of subsidized petrol across its borders. The government has so far not responded to the call by the IMF. It's already earmarked around $1 billion in this year's budget for petrol subsidy payment. So that may just be a clear sign that it may not yet be ready to turn off the tap on petrol subsidy. Worried by the increasing rate of banditry in the north, particularly in Zenfora, Katsina, Kadena and Sokoto State, the Apex Northern Sociocultural Group the Arewa Consultative Forum has convened a meeting of its Board of Trustees. A member of that board says the meeting would discuss the rising incidents of kidnappings and killings in the North in particular and the country in general. The ACF convened the meeting just as the Minister of Defence, Mansour Don Ali, indicted some prominent traditional rulers in the North for aiding bandits in the Northwest. ACF spokesman Alhaji Mohammed Bill declined to comment on the allegation against the traditional rulers. Human rights lawyer Femi Falano has condemned EFCC's continued detention without a charge of a former chairman of the Nigerian Bar Association, Monday Ubani. Falano has demanded the immediate release of the former second vice president of the NBA from the anti graft agency's custody, where he had been held since middle of March. A senior lawyer maintained that Ubani's detention and that of one Christopher in I for a standing surety for a suspect who allegedly absconded was unwarranted because the act did not constitute a criminal offense in Nigeria. The EFCC had said it was detaining Ubani and Enai for standing as charities for Dr. Ngozi Olojeme, said to be a prime suspect in the 68 billion naira fraud in Nigeria's social insurance trust fund. Falano says a Nigerian who stands charity for a criminal suspect commits no offense if the latter does not turn up for his or her trial. Coming up, African stories. Internally displaced persons reach nearly a million in Ethiopia. WHO reinforces medical supplies. And later, international news. Netanyahu claims victory in Israel elections in which outcomes too close to call. You are watching ANN. <sighs> this used to be me. But that was before I got the perfect bag. It's handy and easy to use. All I need in one compact space, just like my MTN Extra Value Plan. I used to get one plan for my calls and then try to remember which data plan worked for me. Roaming was a totally different ballgame. Not anymore. I've got the MTN Extra Value All-in-One Plan. If you're a data buff like me, you get extra data with some talk time. And if you like to make calls, you get extra talk time with some data. And when I'm abroad, I automatically browse, chat, and call right on the same plan. MTN Extra Value was made just for me. More of data or calls. Whichever one you prefer, MTN Extra Value is made just for you. Welcome back. This is ANN News. Now to African Stories. Zimbabwe is seeking more than $600 million from local and foreign donors as aid to cover a food import and help with a humanitarian crisis after a severe drought and a cyclone battered the east of the country. An El Niño induced drought has wilted crops across the country and left about a third of its 15 million citizens in need of food assistance. The situation was worsened when Zimbabwe, along with Mozambique and Malawi, was battered last month by Cyclone Udai, leaving hundreds of thousands needing food, water and shelter. An appeal document given to reporters by the Ministry of Information showed the government is seeking about $300, $300 million in aid for food, while the rest would fund emergency shelters, logistics and telecommunications, among other needs. Hundreds have died in Mozambique and Malawi, and the death toll in Zimbabwe 
was now 344. Meanwhile, in neighboring Mozambique, vaccinations are underway against post-cyclone cholera outbreak. Reporter Robert Nagela is there. It's been a busy couple of weeks at the Munyava Hospital, one of several cholera treatment centers in Vera, run by Medicines and Frontier. We are um, treating cases based on suspected cholera, which is a very basic case definition of at least three watery diarrheas in the last 24 hours with or without vomiting. On March 15th, Cyclone Edai hit Beira, a city of about half a million people. Behind it, a deadly storm surge flooded the city and surrounding areas, destroying Beira's water and sewerage system. The government says as of April 6th, 602 deaths have been recorded as a result of the cyclone, with 342 new cases of cholera reported, according to the United Nations. But the good news is that the oral cholera vaccine campaign, the OCV campaign, has now reached 600,000 people, which is about 60% of the target population, which gives us what we call herd protection. So it gives us a basic level of immunization. And it's here, at a nondescript room, in a corner of the airport at Beira, that a coordinated effort between the government and relief agencies is ongoing. Once an outbreak is reported, health workers, vaccines and medical equipment are dispatched to the affected area. Despite the huge numbers of people affected, officials are confident they're getting ahead of the outbreak. A major cleaning effort continues across the city as authorities race against time to provide access to clean water and sanitation. We still have to be extremely careful about how we get clean water and hygiene into communities. Red Cross has been focused on that. We're also focused on uh, opening oral rehydration points in communities that are heavily affected so people have a place to go. They can be diagnosed, they can get early treatment. Anywhere in Beiro you go, the scars of Cyclone Edai are visible. However, authorities and aid workers believe that they have the cholera outbreak under control. But there is still many more challenges as the city struggles to rebuild. The state of emergency first imposed in 2015 by the Tunisian government has been extended for another month. It was first declared in response to a suicide attack on a police bus, but it has since been extended a number of times. The latest extension will last until early May. Tunisia's Foreign Office continues to advise terror attacks are very likely. And reporter Adnan Chawuche is on Tunis. Tunisia's National Security Council has extended the state of emergency for one additional month on the whole territory. As of Saturday, April 6th, the state of emergency had been decreed since November 24, 2015 following a terrorist attack on a presidential guard bus. The security situation has improved since 2015. ISIL terrorists or cells have been neutralized in Tunisia. However, the threat persists because we live in an unstable region. The state of emergency gives the government all legal means to fight terrorism. The National Institute for Strategic Studies warned against the presence of ISIL militants who have been described as lone wolves. Lone wolves are a threat to national security. Some of the terror plots foiled by the intelligence services or terror attacks perpetrated on Tunisian soil were planned by lone wolves. The state of emergency has allowed authorities to arrest or neutralize some of these extremely violent individuals. During the National Security Meeting at Carthage Palace, Tunisian President Beji Qaida Sipsi warned against the escalation of the armed conflict in Libya and its impact on the security situation in Tunisia. Despite the UN Security Council's call on the forces of Libyan Army Commander Khalifa Haftar to halt all military movements, hundreds of armored vehicles and troops continue their advance towards Tripoli. As long as the situation is unstable in Libya, it will affect the security in Tunisia. Last week, the Arab League announced the holding of a meeting between all Libyan stakeholders in Libya in less than 15 days to pave the way for a reconciliation summit in July. It is clear that some strong actors on the ground reject the UN plan. According to the Tunisian Interior Ministry, Thousands of Libyan citizens have crossed the border between the two North African neighbors, 
Hundreds of national guards have been deployed to guarantee security on the Tunisian side of the border region. Casualties from the battle for Libya's capital mounted on Tuesday, and the United Nations has moved dozens of migrants to safety from a detention center in the south of the capital, where fighting had raged nearby. The World Health Organization says medical facilities have reported 47 persons were killed and nearly 200 wounded in recent days as Eastern Libyan National Army forces seek to take Tripoli from an internationally recognized government. Libya has become the main conduit for African migrants and refugees trying to reach Europe. UN agencies say 5,700 refugees and migrants are trapped in detention centers and conflict areas. The UN refugee agency UNHCR says it has relocated more than 150 refugees from the Ain Zara detention center in South Tripoli on Tuesday to a UNHCR facility in a safe zone. UNHCR said in a statement, refugees have told its workers they were frightened and worried about their safety given ongoing fighting in the vicinity and that they were left with minimal supplies. The statement says the agency was working to ensure other detained migrants and refugees were not in harm's way. When we return, international news. Netanyahu claims victory in Israel's election in which outcome is too close to call. And later, sport. NFF confirms Nigeria legend Christian Chukwu is in good health. You are watching ANN. Somewhere in the world, every second of the day, news is happening. And of course, Nigeria is bustling with news day and night. That is why ANN doesn't sleep. Our eyes are peeled, wide open, so no story escapes our radar. We stay abreast of world events and happenings at home. We keep you up to the minutes in the world of sports. We give you information to stay on top of your investments and all the hard facts you need to navigate your day. If you miss us on air, you can keep up to date on our website, annafrica.net and on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. We are ANN, Africa News Network. We do news right in a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is ANN News. Now it's events happening around the world. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Benny Gantz, a former general and leader of a centrist party, both claimed victory on Tuesday night in a closely fought election race in which exit polls showed no clear winner. Gantz, Israel's former chief of forces and the leader of the Blue and White Party, claimed victory after Israel's highest rated TV station reported he had won 37 seats while Netanyahu lagged behind with 33. Netanyahu also claimed victory, saying the overall number of seats won by his right-wing bloc was larger. He was hanging on the report of the results reported by two other TV stations, showing his bloc had won more seats than the opponent. In the Israeli system, a government coalition needs at least 61 seats in the 120 seats parliament known as the Knesset. No single Israeli party has ever won enough seats to form a government. All governments have been coalitions of several parties. Netanyahu is seeking a fifth term in office. Gantz has been the toughest challenger to, to his consecutive 10-year-long ruling. The results of the elections will determine Netanyahu's political future as he faces serious corruption allegations and a possible indictment. A senior fellow with Cambridge University in the UK says split British public opinions have made the Brexit process more difficult. Martin Jokwe, of the Department of Politics and International Studies at the university, says the prolonged Brexit has made it difficult for the British to rebuild their confidence. The reason it's um, so, so difficult is because the population is divided. It's not just one party against another. Both are political, all the political parties are divided over it. But above all, the population is split down the middle about it. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. Brexit. It's very, very difficult to press the reset, reset button and reconstitute yourselves. And Britain has not 
managed to do that. He even called the Brexit, the current Brexit, a joke. Very bad situation we're in. Um, I mean, the country feels very bad about it, uh, feels alienated from the political process, is disillusioned in politics, feels bad about itself because it's humiliated itself in front of the rest of the world. It's become a joke. It is a joke. Decide whether to grant a further extension to Brexit at the EU leaders' meeting in Brussels today. British media were reporting on Tuesday the European Council President Donald Tusk has written to all 27 EU member states' leaders urging them to offer Britain a flexible extension to the Article 50 process of up to one year that would allow Britain to leave at any point within that period. Residents of Venezuela's capital city of Caracas have taken measures to ensure basic water supply with the help of the local government following a week-long massive blackout. Venezuela has suffered water shortages and a large-scale blackout that affected local transportation systems and communication networks since late March. Presently, power supply to airports, subways and other public areas are basically returned to normal, but water supply in some urban areas is still unstable. Some local residents, with the help of local government, are voluntarily snorry or storing water and helping nearby kindergartens, clinics and other public places to store water. During periods of unstable water supply, local government sends water tenders to nearby schools, clinics and other public places. Residents can also get water at designated areas. There are signs that Australia's economy is in trouble. It was once heralded as one of the most consistent in the world. Economists say the country is in the midst of a per capita recession where the growth of the economy is not keeping up with the increase in population. The masses are feeling it first and are saying something about it. This is a feeling like this economy is not delivering for the broad citizenry, that we're not getting ahead, that we're not moving forward, that the thing is stagnant. The problem is that the country's economy is growing slower than the population. Economists call that a per capita recession. Wage growth began to slow during the global financial crisis and has failed to keep pace with the rate of inflation. The Australian Council of Trade Unions is trying to highlight the impact of a slowing economy on its workers. They're just not earning enough to be able to cover rising costs of things like um, utilities, the cost of gas, of, of electricity, food costs, petrol costs, childcare costs. Economists say Australia's low unemployment rate at around 5% is one of the key factors that is helping to keep the economy from slipping into a full-blown recession. Up next, sports. NFF confirms Nigeria legend Christian Chuku is in good health. You are watching ANN. Are you sure you want to do this? Adam, go and bring us your husband. Okay, hello baby. We're in this together, okay? Can you hear me? Keep coming forward. Wait, 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 stop, stop. <laughs> you okay, Lindsay, you alright? <laughs> Keep walking down. Keep walking to the left. Yes. You're almost here. Keep going. You are here. <laughs> wow, you did it. I'm just so glad I didn't have to use my cane to do this. And I am so glad no other man got you before me. Let me be your eyes. We will never stop working to give you a network you can rely on so you can enjoy life's special moments. MTN, everywhere you go. Welcome back. This is in a news is sport. Chairman of Enugu State Football Association and member of the Nigerian Football Federation Executive Committee, Chidi Okenwa, has confirmed that Nigerian legend Christian Chuku is in good health and of sound spirit. 
There was an outcry over the weekend over the true state of health of Nigeria's 1980s African winning team captain. NFF President Maju Pinik had mandated Okenwa to visit Chuku to find out what needed to be done to get him back to good health. He had promised NFF would do the needful in that regard. Okenwa said Chuku is in very stable condition and is receiving adequate care in a medical facility in Enugu State. The FIFA Women's World Cup trophy will arrive in Abuja on Thursday. What football government body FIFA informed the NFF, the former Nigeria striker Osaze Odenwege, who is one of FIFA's legends for this year's Women's World Cup in France, and three other FIFA officials were due in Nigeria on Wednesday. That is NN News this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on this and other stories, visit the website nnafrica.net. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. I am Olajumokyo Latinji. Have a pleasant evening.